Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the Unblocked podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Smarrow. Thank you for listening today. Okay, so today's title might have some folks scratching their heads. Prison Revolution to Mental Evolution. Where is this going? Well, stick with me and you will see. When I was younger and people asked what I wanted to do when I got big, my answer was two options. I either wanted to be a fashion designer or I wanted to revolutionize the prison systems of America. Those seem pretty related fields, right? The former is actually quite laughable given that my fashion choices lean towards yoga pants and hoodies about 93% of the time. But revolutionizing the prison systems kind of took hold. Shortly after graduating with my master's in social work, I stumbled across a job posting for a program called Jail Alternatives. This program explored ways to intervene differently with individuals who are experiencing mental health and substance use disorders who come in contact with the criminal justice system. So I spent over a decade working with programs to divert individuals from jail and prison. So in my own right, I was revolutionizing some of the systems of incarceration in the country. But then, then it occurred to me, the largest prison system in the country, in the world in fact, is, wait for it, our freaking minds. Think about that. Think about the mental prison we hold ourselves in. Think about the mental clatter that disempowers us, that keeps us stuck, keeps us imprisoned. Let's consider a couple quotes on imprisonment and mindset. The first quote comes from the great Mahatma Gandhi, and he said, you can chain me, you can torture me, you can even destroy this body, but you will never imprison my mind. Now that is some next level mind mastery, am I right? And while that might seem like a lofty goal, we're going to spend some time considering it today. Here's another quote. This one's from Nelson Mandela, and this one might hit a little closer to home. He said, as I walk out the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. So I don't know about you, but I have definitely carried around harsh words, hurtful experiences, mistakes that I had made, so on and so on. I have carried those things around for several hours, several days, or even several years into the future. Now I'm going to share a story here that might sound a little woo-woo for some of you, but hear me out, stick with me. On my first yoga retreat I ever went on, we had the opportunity to get a reading from a psychic mystic. Read Miss Cleo. I'd never had such a reading, or I'd never had such a reading, but I was up for an adventure. And as we started my session, she paused and asked, "Have you ever had a past life regression reading?" Um, no, ma'am. She said, well, there is a lot coming up, and I think we need to address this first before we do any other reading. So she went on to say, you are carrying about nine backpacks worth of baggage. Like, imagine having carabiners clipped into you that are just dragging behind you. Backpacks of baggage and baggage. And now this I believed. I felt, viscerally, I felt what she was saying. I had felt weighed down by heaviness in life. And I, and I don't even know that I could tell what it was directly. And I certainly wasn't aware of um, any past life drama I was holding on to, but I definitely knew that pain and trauma from my early years was still hijacking my life decades later. And here's the thing that happens. We see, we feel, we experience hurtful things, and we internalize it. So what was a 13-second comment or a 20-minute bus ride of bullying continues to haunt us years later and here's the really sneaky part. We start to believe the things. We absorb the lives that, lies that we were told. We believe our mistakes. We believe in the pain that follows us around. We believe that we can't change things. We start to believe that there is something wrong with us, that we are wrong, that we aren't good enough, that we aren't lovable, that our worth is based on our achievements, that the world is a scary place and we will never be safe. We believe people are out to hurt us. We continue to flog ourselves long after the event. So what could have been something that lasted just 13 seconds or just 13 minutes is something we continue to, to carry with us way throughout life. 
a seed gets planted. And rather than picking up that seed and throwing it as far as physically possible, we tend to that seed. We water it, we fertilize it, we reinforce it until it takes root. We become the jailer holding the key to our own mental prison. And often we don't even know it. So I'm going to tell a few stories to illustrate this. Right after undergrad, I did a year of volunteer service in the Bay Area in Northern California. I worked with a program that organized recess and after school activities to help reduce violence and issues that were taking place on the playground. And this was in, you know, inner city Oakland. So there was a fair amount of violence. And this was at an elementary school, keep in mind. And one afternoon, I was chatting with an eight-year-old after he'd been removed from playground activities due to aggression towards other students. And when I asked him what was going on, what's, what's leading to the issues with the other students, his response was, my daddy's in jail for fighting, my uncle's in jail for fighting, this is just who I am. This kid was eight years old, and already the story he was telling himself was that he would be just like his family. This was, it was decided, this was determined, that he would have to follow in their footsteps. That story sticks with me, and it's been nearly 20 years ago. I often find myself wondering where he is now. Another story, I think back to my early days of being a psychotherapist, and I had a young professional sitting in my office, and she was relaying all the phenomenal work she'd done for her community, for her employer, for the clients that she was serving, and yet she wasn't experiencing any joy from what she was doing because her brother had died unexpectedly when they were kids. And she said, and her words stick with me, she said, no matter what I do, no matter how much I do, I can never bring him back and I'll never be him. My parents will never be happy with me. So she was carrying the weight of an event that had happened 18 years prior to sitting in my office. Something, a horrific event, of course. I'm not taking away the tragedy of losing a loved one, of losing a family member. Of course, that's heartbreaking. And also what's heartbreaking is that she was carrying the weight of that 18 years later. And I'm sure many of you can think of your own examples. How is this showing up in your life? What words, experiences, things from your past have you given meaning and given the power to run your life? Again, maybe minutes later, days later, weeks, or decades later. Think about self-sabotage that happens. Maybe you experienced abuse as a kid. So the thought became, nobody loves me. If I get close to people, they'll hurt me. It's better to run and end relationships before I get hurt. And maybe that abuse happened at age five. And at 25, you're still carrying around that pain. You're still experiencing the destruction in your life because of that pain. And again, to be clear, I'm not saying that we're responsible for the bad things that happen to us or for the horrible events that take place in the world. I'm merely introducing the idea that we can choose how they will continue to impact us moving forward. So let's go back to those words of Gandhi. How do we move towards the powerful message he's sharing? You can chain me, you can torture me, you can destroy this body, but you will never imprison my mind. Well, a committed meditation practice is certainly a good start, but what about the other 23 hours and 40 minutes of the day? I think an important thing we need to do to explore that is to unpack the relationship between events, situations, our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. Most of us think that our feelings and emotions are in response to a situation, an event, or a person. This thing happened and I'm upset about it. This thing happened and I'm happy about it. For example, I'm angry, sad, and hurt because my husband cheated on me. I feel self-loathing because I was bullied about my body size and weight. I feel defeated and ashamed because I received a negative evaluation at work. But the truth is that between the event and the feeling was a thought. And that thought created all of the meaning. That thought it is what leads to all the feelings. So let's use the work example or the work evaluation as an example. The objective fact is I just received a two out of five on my performance evaluation. Employee A receives that assessment and thinks, I clearly am worthless. I have no idea what I'm doing. I can't do anything right. I'm probably going to get fired. That string of thoughts would lead to feelings such as defeat, shame, fear of losing a job, etc. Employee B gets a two out of five and thinks, what can I learn from this? Looks like I need improvement in the areas of communication and timeliness. I knew I wasn't performing at my highest level. I think I'll ask my supervisor for training and tools in these categories. Now those thoughts might lead to feelings of curiosity, 
motivation, determination, and taking action from there. Another piece of the thoughts, feelings, action pie is that feelings aren't facts. Or as Dr. Susan David says, feelings are data, not directives. I'm going to say that again. Feelings are data, not directives. We do not have to act on our feelings. Now, to be sure, our feelings drive our behaviors. But if we follow the cause and effect line back to the thought that we had about the situation, we can choose to insert a thought that better serves us, a thought that leads to feelings that empower us to engage in behaviors that give us outcomes we actually want. So think about that again. I, I can't necessarily control my feelings that lead to my behaviors, but what I can control are my thoughts. I can't control the situation that happened. That, that happened in the world. I can't go back and change it. We, we sometimes wish we could. Time machine to go back and change it. A, a situation or circumstance is a neutral event. And we know this because if, if circumstances were not neutral, 100% of the people, 100% of the time would respond exactly the same way. And we know that's not the case. So when situations happen, events happen, we can't change that. But what we can change is the story we tell ourselves about that situation. We can tell, we can change the thoughts that we're having in our brain about that situation. And then subsequent to that, we change our feelings. Thoughts leads to feelings. Events don't lead to feelings. Thoughts lead to feelings. And then our feelings drive our actions. So remember to use those feelings as data and not directives. If I'm not feeling great, then I need to go back and look at the thoughts I'm having about a situation in our, my life. Feelings are great communication devices, right? If I'm feeling a certain way, I know, okay, something's going on in my thought world that I need to look at, right? The challenge is we to dis- tend to spend much of our lives, most of our lives perhaps, trying to rearrange people, situations, circumstances, and events in our external world in an effort to make ourselves feel better in our internal world. We think if we just line these up right, if I get the right job, if I get the right relationship, if my kids are perfect, if everyone gets straight A's and I get perfect evaluations at work and I have just the right amount of money, life will be good. If I just get it right, I'll be happy. Then we find ourselves in feelings of despair perhaps because maybe you've done everything right, right? Maybe you've lined up everything in your life in the way that you thought you were supposed to and yet you, you don't feel joy, right? Maybe you're not feeling the peace and happiness and fulfillment you were seeking. The trick is that we're often missing the fact that our thoughts create our emotional experiences, not the circumstances. So we can busy ourselves, which many of us have, including myself, busy ourselves trying to rearrange the external world, hoping that we can find that inner peace and joy and sense of safety and fulfillment that we're seeking. So chew on that this week. Pay attention to your thoughts. Get curious. Are these thoughts serving me? Do they make me feel how I want to feel? Do I engage in behaviors that benefit me when I think these thoughts? And catch yourselves. This will not be perfect. Of course this will not be perfect. And being perfect is not even the goal. But catch yourself when you feel drawn into the mental drama of wanting to make it somebody else's fault. Wanting to make, if you're feeling upset and frustrated and you want to make it about your spouse not taking out the trash, right? Or if you're feeling overwhelmed and um, frustrated and you want to make it about your, in, you know, insufferable boss, just, and, and I'm not even saying you have to change anything, just pay attention. Just pay attention to your mind's instinct and impulse to want to assign the meaning to the event that's happening in your life. And then maybe just pause and think about what are the thoughts I'm having about this? And if you feel so inclined, maybe write it down. A situation happens and you're feeling something coming up, write down what are all of the thoughts I'm having about this situation, right? My boss is horrible. So write down all of the thoughts. He's unkind. He disrespects me. Um, He doesn't say anything positive. He only points out my negatives. Clearly, I'm never doing anything right. I can't get anything right. I'm not going to get anything accomplished at this job. I may as well go work at Quick Trip. (laughs) You know, whatever the thoughts are, just start to pay attention. And when you see that there might be a pattern, right? Or you see that these thoughts maybe don't serve me. Maybe we can start to introduce some other thoughts 
that can be more helpful, right? And that can be a big jump. And I'm not saying to dive in deep at this point. Uh, and I certainly don't want you to be um, misguided in thinking that I need to go from um, my boss is horrible to I have the best boss in the world, right? That will not feel true and that will not be helpful. But this week, we just want to pay attention. Just pay attention to the thoughts and get curious. Just reflect on how the thoughts might be contributing to the feelings. Just stay open. Just explore it. And ask yourself, is it time? Are you ready? Are you ready to turn the key, unlock the door, and release yourself from your mental prison? I sure am. Until next time, my friends, stay open, stay free.